Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bear with me a second until I get moving here a little bit. Maybe I better use this. Okay. Well, it's good to be here, folks. And uh, I want to talk to you tonight about one of America's most controversial figures, John Brown. This is a photograph of him at age 56 back from Kansas, where uh, he had a tough time and committed what many people feel is a major atrocity. And out there, he suffered from malaria, so he looks a little rough, and he also had trouble getting food, and at the time they had to eat toes of animals. Now, three themes that really, I think we can uh, stress about Brown's life. One, business failure and debt. Now, he started off fairly successful, and he engaged in sundry business, everything from wolf, cattle industry, real estate, you name it. But from really about 1831 to 1851, he had 15 billion business failures. He was constantly in debt. He overextended himself in credit, and he used bad judgment. Now, he looks like a guy that didn't have a sense of humor. In many ways, and slavery certainly did not. And in religion, he certainly did not. But he did find some things in life funny. And when he laughed, he made absolutely no noise. He just shook all over. Now, religion. He almost entered the ministry at age 16. Money and poor eyesight prevented that. And this will be a key thing. Even when he's engaged in business, he frequently gives discourses on, on religion. And of course, the key driving point, especially during the latter part of his life, is the abolition or ending slavery. Okay. Now, what made Brown terrorist? Now, I'm dealing with him as as a terrorist, and want to show uh, that was the key way he hoped to get rid of slavery. His father did not make him a terrorist. This is Owen Brown. Um, but he was very much anti-slavery and extremely religious. He was very strict uh, and stuttered really extensively, except when he prayed, and he did not. Now, Calvinism, which basically Brown would come down from the congregations where Calvin and the Puritan bent. Basically, John Calvin, a reformationist, really considered people bad. He said they should be beaten like dogs. They're prone to sin. You don't give them freedom, because if you give them freedom, they'll sin. But the basic thing that comes down to Owen Brown and his dad, uh, and particularly is the concept of predestination. That since God knows all, he knows before you're born where you're going to heaven or hell. And very few people are going to heaven. Everybody else is going to hell. They're known as the unregenerate. Um, so that's not necessarily very soothing to the people that, and how did you know whether you were safe or not? Well, of course, uh, the, the ministers automatically assumed they were, but it was kind of a, uh, you know, if you behave well, well, maybe you had really a chance, uh, and so forth. The Bible. This is the book in his life. He had 11 Bibles in his house and six New Testaments. And on his will, he had set aside money to buy Bibles for other members of his family, and so forth. Now, he's tremendously influenced by slave revolts, uh, from Spartacus in ancient history through that turn of 1861, uh, 1831, excuse me, in Southern Virginia. There have been 
three major revolts really in, in the South before the Civil War. A major one that breaks out in Richmond, which was very extensive, and that's in 1800, and then in 1822 in South Carolina, the Denmark Vesey uh, revolt. Uh, Denmark Vesey won a lottery of $1,000 for his freedom, and then he revolted. In both cases, these revolts fail because one of the slaves tipped off their owner. Didn't, they didn't want to see him killed. But Nat Turner's a big one that's going to have tremendous influence. Um, because basically, 60 people were killed, mainly men, mainly women and children. And in the South, folks, there's this tremendous fear of slave insurrection. And the Nat Turner insurrection is crucial on that. So this is going to set the stage for a lot of the reaction in the South when John Brown raised Harper's Ferry. Now, guerrilla warfare. He thought this is something that could be used extensively with, with uh, particularly in the mountains, to defend off much a larger force. So he studied those uh, guerrilla warfare throughout history and contempt for the government. Now, when he was barely 13, uh, he was born in, of course, Connecticut, but they moved to Ohio by this time. His father sent him all alone. He was dressed in buckskin, barefooted, 100 miles to drive cattle from Ohio to Michigan during the War of 1812 for the Union, for the U.S. troops. When he, here's a, a kid who had been sheltered in many ways, no profanity, a very strict moral code. And he was totally disillusioned by the action of the profanity and other things about the, about the U.S. Army. So he felt that the Army, he could always take care of. They were so inefficient, he wouldn't have to worry about them. Now, contempt for the government. The government allowed slavery, allowed it to expand. So he had no use for it and, uh, as an agent to bring it into slavery. Basically, he believed violence is the only way to end slavery. For example, this favorite passage in the Bible. Now, he, uh, of all the Bible, the, New, the Old Testament is what he really homes in on. A God of wrath, a God who kills the sinners, punishes the evil. He says, without the remission, uh, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. Now, this is the key thing that will shape his life. So in other words, you're not off the hook if you just say, I'm sorry. You have to pay in blood, whether you're a slave owner or what have you. Jason you know, was three years old, one of his sons, who adamantly told his dad his dream was real. And Brown whipped him brutally for lying. It's, um, he also, the corporal punishment is standard at that time, folks. But the, he will have 20 kids, um, and nine of them will die. Will not make it to no husband. Three by his first wife, and uh, six by his second wife. The first wife died in childbirth. Um, so he kept a book of the, what he considered the sins, particularly of his sons by the first marriage. And then after a certain time, he says, it's time to pay up your account. And he would take them out and whip them so many lashes for not obeying the mother and what have you. And on one occasion, when he was whipping his son, he took the whip from his son and made his son whip him. I don't know what he felt, what he was doing or what. So, now, he was a great believer in the Bible and the Declaration of Independence. And he told Emerson in 1850, it's better that a whole generation of men, women, and children pass away by violent death than one word of either of these be violated. I don't know about you, but that doesn't make me very secure to be around a person like that. 
Okay, the evolution of Brown's plan to end slavery. He was like most abolitionists before 1839, violent underground railroad, things of like that. Then from the 40s and 50s, violence is the answer. Um, and the Appalachian Mountains is going to be a key part of this. Now, how did Brown plan to implement his plan? And why did Brown think that two dozen men can end slavery? He told person, if you give me two men in two years, I can wipe slavery out of this United States. Well, I'm going to answer the second question first. From the Bible, remember, that's the key thing. It gives him a lot of answers. He says that Gideon said that God told him to reduce his force from thousands to 300 to, to defeat the Gideonites, who were people raiding them on camels. And they attacked the Gideonites at night, and they won. So this impressed Campbell, uh, Brown, I should say. Now, another is the Appalachian Mountains. He had surveyed them. He knew them fairly well. And he really believed the mountains were created by God to help the slaves get freedom. Because they use them, uh, the Appalachian Mountains, to run north. And in attack, you can hide yourself you, and defeat any significant force that comes after you. That's what he believed. Uh, he called really an underground railroad that went through the Appalachian Mountains. He referred to that as a, uh, really as a subterranean route. Now, so basically, and he had many plans, folks. He had many plans. He had many areas said at first he was going to attack. So it's kind of all over the map. And things really don't become crystallized. Pretty much the, what would be in the 18, uh, latter part of the 1850s. But he really said, if you, if you could take 25 men, or even 20, and divide them into 25 men in groups of five, you raid plantations to free the slave, Terrorize the slave owner. Here's the key. You want to use violence to terrorize the slave owners. And if they're and to devalue slavery. If they're losing their slaves, then you see, he thought they in their own may they may just get rid of slavery themselves. Brown's logic doesn't necessarily uh, ring true in, in, in many cases. Now, he forms the 1851 the United League of Gideonites. This is simply to arm runaway slaves in the north so they can't be returned, so they fight the return. Um, he, uh, in 1856, he was out in Bleeding, Kansas, where the pro and anti people were fighting each other. Atrocities were unbelievable on both sides. But Brown says it's it's better that tw a, a score of evil men, meaning pro-slave people, die than one anti-slave person in Kansas. So one night, his sons and a couple other men, he goes down into an area where it's pro-slave people, but these two people, the two families he visits, they don't know any slaves. He knocks on the door. So this is fun, so and so where your grown sons come out. The next morning, the wife go out, find her sons hacked to death, and find her husband with his hand, skin hanging, hand barely detached, and his brain being washed away by the creek that he's fallen in. Now, he took up, as a matter of fact, some of his sons, and particularly he went down and cried and went back and said, We're never going to do this again. But said it's okay. They're evil. They got to be punished. So this is known as the Pottawatomie Creek Massacre of 1856. Now, Brown to get his plan of freeing the slave money. So he gets the support of an aristocratic group of six men in the north. Four of them have Harvard degrees. Um, there's a world-renowned doctor, Dr. Howe. 
Theodore Parker, two congressional, congregational members, Parker was one. He spoke 20 languages, had 16,000 books in his library. They give him money, but not as much as he wants. And Brown doesn't tell him everything he's going to do. Now, he hires Hugh Forbes, a guy who fought with Gary to train his men. Total disaster. Forbes didn't, didn't train anyone but one of Brown's men. They argued over money, and particularly they argued over what should be done. Forbes warned Brown, said, slaves will not rise up and join you. So that didn't work. Now, Brown's going to mimic the American Revolution. You see, the American Revolution, he's basically the Americans fighting against British tyranny and George III. Okay. So you're trying to free two and a half million people from British tyranny. Brown said, I'm trying to free almost four million people from slavery. So what he'll do at the home of Frederick Douglass in Rochester, New York, uh, in 1858, he draws up a provisional constitution because Brown really one time to take over part of the United States and implement his government. Now, this is from the U.S. Constitution, a much more simplistic uh, in numbers, but you have your three branches, but he adds a, a fourth, and that was that the commander in chief. Any legislation that's to be passed had to not only be signed by the president, but signed by the commander in chief. Commander in chief was John Brown. The, now, so they meet Adam in Canada in a, in a church, 45 people, two thirds are African Americans, and they ratify the provisional constitution. Then, was outside of Harper's Ferry, the candy farm, he draws up a Declaration of Independence for, for the slaves. Uh, he calls the Declaration of Liberty by the representatives of the United States of America. Um, and he scratches out George III, puts uh, the idea of well, being the owners of slavery in there. So um, later on, he contends, well, I don't plan to destroy the American government. This is to supplement it. Um, the next year, in 1859, he goes Missouri hits two plantations, kills one of the plantation owners, uh, takes 11 slaves and property, all kinds of property, because Brown said, it's okay to take property from slave owners. And so he takes these 11 slaves, and over 40-some days in dead of winter, he, he raids this in December, uh, goes to Canada. Now, the Missourians are really upset about this. And when Brown finds out, he's encouraged. So, ah, I got a way I can hit the South and destroy, uh, destroy slavery. Brown now is, people are looking for him. He's, he's considered an outlaw. And when he has to be careful even in the North because there are agents for him. A bounty is put on his head. And he also, in kind of mockery of the federal uh, what would be bounty. He put a $25 bounty on President Buchanan if he would be brought to another jail. That's more than just. So Brown used aliases. Then in the summer, early July and October, he mobilizes his force, his army at the Kennedy Farm. This is the Kennedy Farm. There's a house itself, a really small house, a kitchen, the top part there, storage down below. It's the main living room, which is mainly the furniture or, or simply trunks of rifles he brought down from Chambersburg. And uh, the guys gradually assemble over the summer. 21 men will assemble there, and many of them have to sleep up in the attic there. Now, Finally, after he brings down 200 Sharps rifles, um, 200 pistols, 13,000 rounds of ammunition, and uh, four times that of 
of uh, percussion cups and things of that nature, but shovels and uh, blankets and what have you. And he makes nightly trips up to Chambersburg, about 60 some miles from Harpers Ferry, and stores them at the Kennedy Farm. Then he tells his men, okay, we're going to attack Harpers Ferry, and we're going to wait until the people, the slaves and the anti slave people around uh, Maryland and, and, and Virginia. You have to realize that Harpers Ferry at that time is still Virginia. Um, <clears throat> his sons and other people say, hey, you're going to get us killed. This, the Harpers Ferry is surrounded by high ground on three sides. You have the Potomac and Shenandoah. You have two bridges over it. We'll be trapped and killed. And Brown said, well, it, so be it. Then we'll help bring on the Civil War to get rid of slavery. So finally his sons did not want to see Brown said, we can't let Daddy get killed by himself and the other guys down there. We, we got to go, although uh, we think it's going to be the end of us. And so on October the 15th, on a rainy Sunday night at 8 o'clock, uh, they'll start moving. They come down, they cut the telegraph line, they seize the bridge over the tunnel, which is both a railroad and a passenger, a, a pedestrian bridge. They will take the armory, which is the main arsenal of the United States, to produce weapons. Uh, it's about a quarter mile long, 18 major buildings. Uh, this would be the entrance of it here. He also takes control of the bridge here, takes two arsenal buildings here, and goes up a little more than half a mile to Hall's Rifle Factory, or at that time, which the government has control of it. Then he sends, in the middle of the night, a group of people, the Kenny Farm is roughly up here about five miles away. He sends people down about equal distance to Colonel Washington, the grand nephew of George Washington. Kidnaps him, three of his slaves, takes a wagon, his horses, comes back by Halstead, kidnaps him, his son, takes seven slaves, brings them back, gives the slaves pikes, he brings some pikes down. Because when he was at <clears throat> the Kenny farm, he brought down almost a thousand pikes. Now, pikes were a much more efficient weapon for slaves to use than really guns. He had a great faith in what he called the blade. Um, now, during the night, he'll stop the train. The B and this is B and o, the other railroad just only goes to Winchester. But the B and O stopped, and passengers somewhat panicking and what have you. And the danger, I should say, Haywood Shepherd, which is a drawing, it's the only thing we have of him, which is the baggage master. What he will do. He will walk out here to see one of the night watchmen. They had night watchmen in each of these places, but they weren't armed. They were only watchmen to make sure the fires didn't get out of control. Um, when he goes out here, the couple of Brown's men here, they order him to halt. He doesn't know what that means. He runs away, they shoot him, he's hit in the back. He struggles back to really <clears throat> would be a depot. They place him on a board on two chairs. He's screaming and hollering in pain. Wakes up a, a doctor story in a hotel nearby who comes down and sees the wound is fatal. And then story will go around trying to find out what's going on. It took him a couple hours, but he'll later go over to uh, Charleston, Charlestown, not Charleston, and alert the militia there. And they'll be the first outside of the people in Harvey's Ferry to come. Um, now, so the first man killed, uh, Haywood Shepherd was a free man who lived in Winchester, had a family there. The first man killed in Brown's raid was a, a free African American. Now, basically you see three stages in Harper's Ferry raid. The first stage from the Sunday night to Monday noon, he has, brings 18 men with him they control Harpers Ferry. But the militia then starts coming in. Because what he will do, not only did Story alert the militia over in uh, Charlestown, 
But when he releases the train in the early morning, what do they do? They contact the government. And consequently, not only Buchanan, Governor Wise, Virginia, and Buchanan sends Jeb Stewart to tell Lee to come out here. So what you'll have during the, the day here, you have militia coming not only from Charlestown, not only people in here that grab some weapons that fight on their own, residents of, of uh, Harbors Ferry, but you'll have from the middle of the afternoon people from Martinsburg, uh, you'll have people coming from Frederick, and people from Winchester. And they trap Brown. So the second stage, Brown's trapped. With all these militia coming in. The first coming across the bridge, of course, the people from Charlestown. And Brown's men are forced off, including the oldest of Brown's men, except himself, Danbury Newby. Uh, Newby's body is drug in the gutter and left there. Dogs uh, will sniff the congeal blood. A hole comes up, sticks its snout in it, pulls out all. Uh, now, Newby enjoyed Brown because he's, try he's free. He's a free African American. He's trying to get the free, buy his freedom of his wife, who lived only 30 miles south of Harvest Ferry, but the owner wouldn't sell it, sell it to him. So he's trying to really um, get his wife's freedom. And she wrote some very, very moving letters. Uh, if you don't come soon, we're going to sell me down the river. And that's exactly what happened to her. Now, early in the afternoon, the youngest of Brown's people here is really a uh, Lehman. He runs out from down here. And right on the top is where the railroad is. The militia get up there. And a guy walks out and shoots him in the head. And they set him down on the rock there. And they use it for target practice. So eventually goes down in the water. Um, later, Brown feels that basically he has one thing that will always get him out of trouble. By taking hostages like Washington, he felt, OK, this is my get out of jail free card. He tries to use it several times, really on this Monday. In mid-afternoon, he sends um, one of his sons and a couple other men out under flag of truce. The local militia of Farrell, uh, mortally wounding one of his sons, um, severely wounding Stevens, and they capture um, William Harrison. And they take him to a really a hotel, and they want to shoot him in a hotel to a woman. I said, no, you can't shoot him in here. They take him out and shoot him, throw him over in the river. And you see his eyes glazing up through the water. Um, so one reason that one of the biggest flaws that Brown made in his raid, he didn't have any plan for evacuating. But he didn't think he had to. Because as long as I have the hostages, and the, and the reason that the hostages deal didn't work he said, you have to let me cross the Potomac Bridge, go down to the schoolhouse, which is uh, really uh, still along the canal, and I'll release the, ha the hostages, and then we'll fight it out. And of course, nobody really would accept that. So the militia could have captured Brown on this day, but many of them are drunk. Uh, a lot of alcohol was uh, consumed and what have you. Third stage captured Brown on the morning. Jeb was sent by Lee, said, town surrender. Brown said, okay, let me cross the, the Potomac Bridge. I'll release the Hodges. We'll fight it out. And Lee had told Stuart, no surrender. If he refuses, wave your hat. And he does. So they take a couple of sledgehammers and try to break in. But the door is tied with rope, and it gives. Um, so it's kind of a Green, who's leading the torch, has a ladder, 40-foot ladder. He used a ramrod. The second um, plunge, they break a hole in the door. The Marines go in, people inside, the brown fire upon Marine one killed, one's hit in the, in the mouth. 
And then this is all over. Uh, what happens? Green goes in, he goes around, he has a light ceremony. He stabs him in the, in the uh, abdominal area. It bends. Pierce. And he hacks him on the back of the head, putting a severe cut, making Brown somewhat stunned and unconscious. So they drag him out. And Brown is put in one of the buildings near the so engine house, which becomes far engine house, which becomes known as John Brown's Fort. Uh, he's panicked. You hear and read traditionally, Brown is brave in every situation. Here's a man that probably hadn't eaten two and a half days, just drank coffee, and he believed that God was going to lead him to success. Where's God? But what really scared him is the mob that was gathering around. Because there was a tremendous crowd gathering around when they took Brown out of the fort. One guy would take him and one, one on each arm. So guys, get away. Let the women come in and watch the corpses and see the captains. So finally, when Brown realizes that he's secure, uh, he's interviewed in the afternoon and actually seemed to gain his composure unbelievably. Most people were extremely impressed when he responded to the different questions, how he did it. Now, forces are sent up to the Kennedy farm. They find letters from the Secret Six. They find not only the bikes, the weapons, and all the other things. Then they find a map. And John Brown had a series of maps that you'll come down like this through the Appalachian Mountains and basically attack and free the slaves. The slaves that didn't want to join in fighting could go to freedom up the mountain. But there are four states from the business here. South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi that Brown down had very heavy slave populations. So in each one of those, he circles, this is where he's going to hit. Now this is tremendously impactful on the psychology of the South. Hey, they're coming for us. Um, it's interesting uh, to note that people, you know, the New Republicans especially, they're out to get us. They're out to get us. Now, that afternoon, Brown's captured. The Brown will have 10 men killed. And, um, eight of the bodies will be taken and put in rifle boxes and buried on the shore of the Shenandoah. Gravesite gets lost. And, and the guy on the, uh, there on the right would be uh, Dr. Featherstone Hall who searched for Brown for this grave for a long time. This fellow here lived nearby and saw him, period. So he took him to it. This is an actual photograph of 1885 of the opening one of the graves. And when they took the top off of one of the boxes, they were really, it was a vertebrae stuck to it. They were just all crammed in uh, to the boxes. Now two of the people were buried there, Brown's son Watson, and Emperor, uh, who really was a runaway slave that joined Brown, their bodies would be taken to Winchester and used as cadavers. And uh, during the 1862, when the Union got control of Winchester, a physician from Minnesota took uh, Oliver uh, Watson Brown's body back with him. And they used it for the certain ceremonies and so forth. And finally, one of his brothers found him, and his body was taken to North Elba and buried with John Brown. Well, the impact of Brown's raid, terror in the South, convinced there's a Northern conspiracy because they found letters, you see, of the Secret Six, what have you. Um, as I said, 10 raiders and five civilians were killed, nine civilians were wounded. 
Seven raiders will escape, but two will be captured. Now the law of Brown's force of 21 or 22 counting himself. 17 of them are killed. That's pretty much a total military disaster. Now, terror in the South, for example, long before Brown's raid, had no tolerance to criticism of slavery. None. There was a minister in Texas, Brown's raid, who was very much for slavery, said you should treat your slaves better. This was a 60-year-old minister. They took him out back of the church after the service was over and gave him 70 lashes on his back. There was a mason that was from the north that was working in the south, and he found a northern newspaper that his clothes were wrapped in. They kicked him out of the south. Kicked him out of the south. Now, one thing that's never mentioned is the extensive number of union meetings throughout major northern cities condemning Brown's and supporting the South and saying, we've got to keep the union together. And they brought in former presidents. So, uh, they had pictures of all the major uh, <clears throat> men in American history, tremendous bands, tremendous number of people, in, like in Philadelphia and New York, that wanted to show the South, hey, don't leave. We want to stay together. So these are the union meetings over the city. Now the South start the militia units, particularly the South, were disasters. They were non-existent almost. They drilled oftentimes they had to use corn stalks and broom for, for rifles. So now you're going to have a total reorganization, um, getting new weapons. And this is really the rehearsal for war, because no matter what the South did here will be used at the beginning of the Civil War. Now, Brown's taken to um, Charlestown to try. It's known as the trial of the century. Now, see, that Brown's raid is the national newsmaker. You have reporters from all the press, what have you. Now, there was a rush for judgment because basically the Judge Parker had to be in Winchester in November. Some said, should we wait till spring? But the authorities obviously didn't want to do that. So, and three and a half day trial starting October 27th, Brown will be, and he's taken, you see, there's a bed and he's walking here. And this is, you can't see it, but he's in his cot right in the middle. Tremendous crowds. It's like a circus. They eat peanuts and you crunch all over. When you walk, it crunched all over the floor and what have you. And he would interject during the trial. Now, a jury of slave owners convicted him, along with his other men, murder, insurrection, and treason. Now, there's a real question here where Brown committed treason against Virginia since the property that he attacked was federal property. He's sentenced to be executed on December the 2nd. Now, six of Brown's men will be hung after Brown, four on December the 16th, and the last two on March the 16th, 1860. Now, <clears throat> the courthouse is here, that's a jail, uh, what will happen on the morning of December the 2nd when the sun rose on the 40-acre field of which Brown was to be hung, wheat field, you have all kinds of flags indicating where the regiments are to be placed. And then at one side, you have a, really a broom handle with a note, and that's where the gallows to be assembled. Now, the gallows wasn't assembled until the morning of the execution. Brown is to be <clears throat> executed at 11. At early morning, it's a beautiful day, believe it or not. Spring day, birds singing, windows are open. Um, he's very busy 
making last changes to his will and laying up the letter. Finally, they said, hey, it's time to go. So he goes down and says goodbye to his men, uh, tells them not to implicate anyone, uh, and he gives all of them a quarter. But John Cook, who was one who had written a confession earlier. So he comes out of the jail, and he has probably, you consider the, the forces at the jail and the forces on the execution site, about 600. He has a tremendous guard accompanying him. This is showing him on the wagon. Um, now, he's, he's sitting on a poplar wood box inside a, a uh, walnut casket, which has scribed on it, John Brown Esquire. So up front would be the undertaker, the sheriff, the jailer, and this is John Brown, and that's just sit, undertaker's assistant. The wagon actually was yellow. Uh, not that that's important, but the point is that at that time, undertakers also were carpenters. You know, they had to make the casket, but also you could do other business as well. It's only 400 yards from the jail to the execution site. Um, a square of, of two squares of militiamen around the execution site and the cavalry out of that. Now, no women or children were allowed to, to attend. And actually, they did restrict a lot of people coming because trains came in, came in bringing loads of people that went to the Harpers Ferry and they wouldn't we'll let them go to Charlestown for the execution. Brown seems very sprightly go up the steps. People seem very impressed with that. Because Brown had to shift after his capture. Okay, if God's not going to help me free the slave through violence, and Brown said he's going to use me as a martyr to free the slave. So I will die as a result of judicial murder. So he reads scriptures, writes letters. So now he sees himself and really, in a sense, almost compares himself a little bit to Christ. That he's his life to get rid of slavery. Only three people are on this rickety gallows. A sheriff, Campbell, um, the, the jailer, and Brown. They put a white hood over Brown's head. The wind blew it out of face. Campbell asked Avis, the jailer, do you have a pen? Brown said, I have one in my right lapel, sewed in. They take that, fasten the, the, the hood. Then Sheriff Campbell tries to explain why the delay. Brown had to stand there about almost 15 minutes, which must seem like an eternity. And Campbell tried to explain to him the reason. Brown said, I don't care. Just don't keep me waiting. That was the last time you would hear his twangy voice. So finally, the order is given by the commandant of the EMI. Sheriff Campbell ready. Didn't hear him. He repeats it. Campbell comes down off of the gadget, hits the rope. And the only thing you could hear over the field was the screeching of the hinges. Pound drops. Notice the shortness of the rope. It's not very far. He will gradually bring his arms up and his knees up. He gradually go limp. And he will roll around. Looking like a scarecrow. His clothes being too big for him. Everybody is mesmerized. After four minutes' time, he's strangled to death. Twenty minutes later, the physicians go up, listen to his, take his pulse, which it was done, and listen to his heart. Then 37 minutes after being on the gallows, he's cut down. His wife, who had visited him the day before, was waiting for his corpse at Harvest Ferry. Some of the people, when he had this cut down, wanted to have him injected <clears throat> with cyanide or his head cut off so they wouldn't parade him through the north as a hero. But they waited a while until the rigor morsus set in. 
Then he was taken over by a special escort to uh, Harper's Ferry and turned over to his wife. Now, and so from the 2nd to the 7th, Brown's body is taken uh, up to New Elba, New York, in the Catskill Mountains. They go by boat, uh, railroad. Um, when they get to New York, the body is put on ice. And a new collar was put around his neck. And they get him a new casket because his wife didn't want him buried in anything they raised in Virginia. So he's buried here in a godforsaken place in the Catskill with a terrible farm. Um, they have a, put his body on the kitchen table for the entrance of the door. Everybody goes by, particularly the women look at it, and then they bury him. Now, on the day that Brown was hung, there were tremendous uh, celebrations, particularly by the anti-slave people in the North. They fire cannons, they ring the bells, speeches are given, calling Brown a saint. Um, there was a boy by the name of John Brown uh, living there, and his friends took him and they mocked the hanging. They put a rope around his chest, threw it over a, a limb, pulled it up, but unfortunately the rope slipped around his neck. Blood started coming from his nose. Luckily a woman nearby out in the sea and ran out with a butcher knife and cut him down, uh, saving his life. Now, did John Brown cause the Civil War? Well, he's certainly a key factor, but not alone. You have, of course, two different economies due to the difference in geography in the North and the South. That's why slavery died out first in the North. Slavery is dying out after the American Revolution, even the South, till cotton comes in, uh, which is known as white gold. So Brown is a factor. But the other things that precede him, even going back to, and that turns insurrection, sets a stage which they usually solved earlier by compromise. But now feelings are so great and hatred so bitter. And of course, the final stage that really started it was the election of Lincoln and the secession of the lower southern states. Was Brown insane? To most people probably up in the 1950, in the United States considered Brown an evil man who was probably nuts except to his followers. Now, since that time, Brown has looked upon as a hero. Why? Because he fought against slavery. They overlook the method they want to use. So the title of the book is not saying that terrorism is good. It's simply saying that public opinion considers a terrorist a hero. Now, so this is the last year. This is the coat that he wore during the raid, the coat during the trial, and during his execution, when he went up the steps, he had on red slippers. And this coat will be washed when he's in jail, washed again when he's, in, <coughs> he's embalmed in New York. The time of the raid, he cut off almost all of his beard. He came to Virginia known as Isaac Smith. So Brown, in many ways, was more successful in death than he was in life. Thank you. That's a good point. That's a good point because originally, this is inconsistency in Brown. I guess we all have some inconsistency. Originally, the idea was that you would attack the, you know, the, the army and so forth because that's what uses all these weapons to arm slaves who are going to join you. But the closer he gets to the attack, he seems to not be concerned with that. He doesn't really seize any 
He seized control of the arsenal, but he didn't really take any of those weapons either. In the meantime, during the raid, he has the men that he left back at the candy farm taking the weapons down to the schoolhouse, which is just across you know, on the canal. So that's a key point that you really can't reconcile. Um, I, I guess we're all guilty of bad judgment at some time. Uh, and it, Brown is the time you say, well, you know, I don't understand him. I just don't understand him. His sons, but well, when they left the candy house that Sunday night, they said, you know, Daddy, he's going to wait and wait until we get trapped. But we can't let him die alone. So I don't really have a good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's an interesting thing. The, he would have the five men in uh, <clears throat> Kansas during the Potawatomi Creek Massacre. When he goes, as one of his orders, when they go to Harper's Ferry, he orders his men not to shoot unless you're shot upon. And then that's a different ball game. So he does later have the strength. So technically, he didn't personally kill anyone in the Potawatomi Creek Master, but he had them killed. Um, at Harper's Ferry, you could say, well, OK, the civilians killed. Uh, he's responsible for. But he doesn't really murder anybody outside of that. Uh, so he's not a traditional, we say, uh, murderer. Well, he certainly uses it as a starting point. The point being that Douglas, Frederick Douglass warned him, and, and his sons warned him. <laughs> You're not going to be able to. Keggy, who was the second in command, who was uh, over at the um, rifle works, uh, constantly during the, the morning, um, Monday morning, said, we got to get out of here. we got to get out of here. So the... Um, I don't know that he would have been able to hold that permanently. Well, I don't say he's going as much as saying in his mind he thought it was a good idea. Well, he seemed to he seemed to give that up to going down through the Appalachian Mountains, and to particularly hit those four southern states with tremendous slave population. But this so is, yeah, you could I say. Well, your sins can't be can't be first, except for blood. Yeah, he got that from the Bible. He underlined it in the Bible. So did he actually make that statement before he was hanged? No, not not before he was hanged. He made it earlier, much earlier in his career. Um, in 1850 is when he made the, and before that he he had already underlined. Well, you got to yeah, that's, uh, yes, I agree. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, again, thank you very much, sir. Fantastic presentation. Thank you.